Well, thank you very much. Thank you very well, I'm very Christ. pleased to have that and to have uh, Junior here. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, we, we appreciate very much your... Here, I can give this to uh, okay. Dave here. Gee, thank you. I'm, that's nice to have. Well, thanks. we appreciate very much your giving the Washington Times your first post-election well, newspaper board very interview. Pleased. Body, <laughs> <laughs> you fix that. <laughs> well, Mr. President, we know you're busy, so perhaps we could just uh, go ahead with a few All questions. Right. It's been suggested you have only six to 18 months to accomplish your agenda before your post-election honeymoon with Congress ends. What is your uh, strategy to capitalize on your victory with an even more recalcitrant Congress, particularly after the 1986 congressional elections? Doesn't this threaten the completion of the Reagan revolution? Well, I've never thought that the completion of what we've been trying to accomplish is going to be easy, and particularly as long as there uh, is in the House a, a definite majority of the other side. On the other hand, we have accomplished, I think, a great deal. Uh, we'd be much further ahead if we'd gotten all we asked for from the very beginning. But uh, we're going to keep right on with uh, those things and uh, uh, see what we can do. First of all, I think we have to, um, we have to go after some budget reforms. Uh, you realize there hasn't been a budget since I've been here? And I guess even before I got here, the budgeting process is just a kind of a chaotic thing and finally you get a package of appropriation bills. Until we can have a budgeting process where you start out and set a figure as to what overall can be spent. And then within that, negotiate out as to which uh, program gets how much uh, and arrive at a consensus on that, uh, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, we need to do that. We need the balanced budget amendment. We need the line item veto uh, if we're to do uh, those things. We need uh, economic growth. We need and for that, uh, uh, we've got to have the tax simplification program that we've been studying and working on. Um, we've got to have such things as enterprise zones, uh, everything that will help stimulate the growth of the economy because that is the sure way uh, back to sensible running of the government. And we've got the goes without saying, the defense and the uh, security assistance measures and so forth, uh, that we have to have. That's the top priority of government in the sense that that's the main constitutional requirement is the security of the people. And then with there are social things that I think we want having to do with uh, uh, abortion, uh, school prayer, tuition tax credits, things of that kind. And uh, what we're going to do is try to work with the leadership of the Congress. And I'm not sure that it is even more hostile, hostile or inimical. Uh, if, if it is, and if it simply tries to throw roadblocks, uh, then yes, we take our case to the people. Yeah. Mr. President, the, uh, the deficit has been described as a debt that the, the people, American people owe themselves. Uh, as such, does the deficit really matter? Uh, or has the slowdown in the economy forced you to reconsider whether growth can substantially reduce the deficit? Well, of course, we had this example this year in which some $20 billion uh, came out of the deficit uh, as it had been projected by ourselves for this present year. And that was almost entirely due to the economic growth. But when you say the deficit, and does it really matter? Well, for 50 years, uh, that's what the Democrats have been telling us, that it didn't, that we owed it to ourselves. 
I think that to look at just the deficit ignores the real problem. The deficit is a result. What you have to get at is the problem, and that is government is spending too much and is spending too big a share of the private sector. The, uh, that's why my opposition to those who think that the only answer to deficit spending is higher taxes. Well, we've done that in the past. And all it did was take the burden off the backs of those who wanted to spend more so they could just go ahead and spend more. If you look at about the five years before we came here, uh, taxes just about doubled. And the deficit uh, came up to over something like $318 billion. I've, uh, in fact, just a little while ago, I was citing some figures. If you go back to 65, and in the years following 65 is when the Great Society got underway. 65 to 80 in those 15 years, the budget, the overall spending, increased about uh, four and a half times. The deficit increased 38 times. So uh, I think the, we go back to what the classical economists used to say at the turn of the century, that when we had, as they put it, business cycles and hard times, it was usually when government spending crept up to above, they never told you what the percentage was, but above a certain percentage uh, of the gross national product, took that much more money out of the private sector. That's when you had hard times. Well, I think that's what, we're, what we've been seeing. Uh, Mr. President, how far are you prepared to go to support the Treasury's modified uh, flat tax plan? And are you fully committed to pushing a uh, comprehensive tax reform through Congress in this year? And if you want a balanced budget, uh, why don't you submit one? <laughs> I haven't been able to get the budget I wanted <laughs> as low as I wanted it <laughs> without going that far. I don't think there's anyone that would suggest that at this point you could suddenly come back and say, here, we're." Uh, not without uh, hurting an awful lot of people. What I think you have to do is look down the road and say, let's aim at a target here that we're going to get this budget on a declining pattern. And then maybe you can't exactly foretell the day at which it would happen, but if you can, if you can get the, the spending level, the share of private level coming, or even if it isn't coming down, if your budget continues to increase to meet needs and whatever inflation there is, but if it increases at a lower rate than it has been, and if the growth of the economy you can bring up, those two lines are going to meet someday. And when they meet, you've balanced the budget. And as this one goes on past, you begin to get the surplus that you should use to reduce the national debt. And this Excuse is what we're trying to do. Excuse me, but uh, the earlier part was, how far are you prepared to go to support uh, the oh, that one, tax. yes. Well, you kind of got me. There on my desk is the printed version of the whole study of the Treasury Department. And I, no decisions have been made. We've just had a briefing of the Cabinet on it. Everyone is now studying it. I think it has come uh, with a recognition that there are some options in there, that it is not a hard and fast plan. And so I want to study uh, this and then when you say about Congress, we've got two tax proposals in Congress, and one from the Democratic side, one from the Republican side, not too far apart, as I don't think this one is too far apart. Well, I think that it shows that the climate is there, that if we get going and we want to, we want to take this up with the Democratic leadership, we also want to make it available to the public, to all the various groups out there so that they understand what it is we're trying to do. And I think that with all of that pot there of three, you might say, proposals, I think we can come up with a plan that calls for simplification and, uh, and lower tax rates uh, in the areas that will make it uh, more fair than the tax system is, certainly simplified. And I know that there are some very interesting proposals the Treasury Department has come up with. Uh, to do that, uh, 
with regard to easing the burden at the bottom, uh, lowering the rates for everybody, and, uh, and simplification, making it far more simple. For one thing, the going down to th three <laughs> tax brackets instead of 14 is a pretty good step. Mr. President, even after uh, the election, there's still some muttering that, about the GOP gender gap. Uh, now it looks like there isn't a senior foreign policy post in the White House for a woman who dazzled them in Dallas, Jean Kirkpatrick. Uh, how can you let her leave the cabinet? And what will you offer her to induce her to stick around? <laughs> well, she and I are scheduled for a talk this week. Uh, we've talked off and on, and I've, I've known about her feelings now about uh, the UN job. Um, but I don't know when, when she talks whether she is uh, determined that she wants to return to her previous profession, the, the academic world, or whether she is still interested in government. And believe me, I want to find something for her in government if I can, because uh, uh, I, I count on her a great deal, and I value her, uh, her abilities and her great intelligence uh, too much to just sit there and let her go if there's a way to keep her. So I'm going to try to keep her. She's turned us around in the UN, our position in the United Nations, and, and she did it. But there isn't any way she could stay, uh, function in the White House, is there? I don't see anything there that would be, be worthy of her, but I... Uh, so I'm... I'm gonna... But it depends, first of all, on what are her desires. What is it? How strongly does she feel about whether she wants to leave entirely? But you would like her to stay on up at the UN? What's that? You would like her to stay on up at the UN? Uh, well, except that I can't ask her to. That, that assignment has a way of uh, kind of burning people out. And, and uh, I, think she's, I think she's had about all of that that, <laughs> that she wants. Did you a little arm twisting to keep her? Did that to keep her there as long as she has. <laughs> but I, I have to... No, I, I, it's difficult for me when someone really has served and done the job and you know that uh, they've kind of had it. Uh, it's very difficult for me to try to persuade them to do it. Huh? Mr. President, why, after an overwhelming electoral victory, has arms control become such a high priority for you and that there's now a rush to the negotiating table? Isn't the evil empire evil any longer? Or uh, aren't you still concerned about the Soviet disdain for treaty obligations? Uh, I have been as critical as anyone of previous agreements in many instances where I thought uh, somebody just made an agreement to have an agreement. Uh, I have all the quotes of Brezhnev and others with regard to detente and what they thought of it. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're aware that Mr. Brezhnev uh, uh, said that detente was serving their purpose and that by 1985, they would be able to get uh, whatever they wanted uh, uh, by, by other means. Um, the, so I have no illusions about them. But I do believe that the Soviets can be dealt with if you deal with them on the basis of uh, what is practically practical for them and uh, that you can point out as to their advantage as well as ours to do certain things. Now, I think, it's, I think they have seen that if it's to be a, an arms race, if we are determined that we're not going to let them maintain or enlarge their superiority in weapons, and they know our industrial power and might, and they see that we're determined uh, to not let them maintain or continue that lead, then rather than an arms race, I think there's an advantage to them in saying, well, maybe Maybe we better uh, find a different way. And uh, believe me, I would not hold still for a deal that simply makes a deal. Evil empire, the things of that kind. I thought, I, I wasn't just sounding off. I figured it was time to get their attention, to let them know that I was viewing them realistically. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's worked. They, they, uh, you know, everyone says about the horrible relations between the two of us, but uh, they haven't gained an inch of territory in these four years. 
And in the four years before, they were, uh, there was Afghanistan and there was Ethiopia and South Yemen and there they were advancing down through Africa. Uh, so I don't think the relations have been all that bad. Why do you think they dropped the preconditions to the arms talks at this time? They dropped the? The preconditions to the arms talks. Uh, well, I just, I think that, uh, I think they were kind of stalling until the election mm -hmm. also, and uh, then decided, well, now they know who's going to be around for, <laughs> for a while longer, and uh, mm -hmm. they've made a proposal, and uh, we've said fine. Mr. President, uh, Congress has prohibited support for the uh, Contra forces fighting against the government of Nicaragua. Uh, how can you live with this restriction? And doesn't it send a message to the world that it might be risky to be a friend of the United States as it was when President Carter was here? Well, this is, this is one of the things where I think this, the Congress up till now has been short-sighted and, in fact, irresponsible with regard to that situation down there. And uh, we are hopeful that we know that there was a kind of a consensus of feeling just recently uh, among them when they believed, uh, as we all did, that possibly that ship was bearing high-performance planes, MiGs, uh, to Nicaragua. We don't know for sure that it wasn't. Uh, we can't prove that it was, we can't prove that it, it wasn't because of uh, some maneuverings that went on. But there are six more Russian ships, as nearly as we can count, that are on their way to Nicaragua now with more arms. I think that maybe if, the, if they remember that feeling that they had uh, with regard to the possibility of high-performance planes, that they will see that there is value in our carrying on. What we have are revolutionaries that only a short time ago they and the Sandinistas were all on the same side, fighting the same revolution, and fighting it ostensibly, and by their own claim, for democratic processes. Now they got in and a la Cuba under Castro, the one faction took over, has created a totalitarian Marxist state. It is not and the others are still in a revolution, still trying for the, for the democratic principles that they'd fought for in the beginning. And uh, I think that, the, the, and the very fact that the Sandinista element is continuing to support revolutionaries who are trying to overthrow a duly elected government, uh, this is of itself. Uh, of great interest to us. Sir, have you drawn a line that says if you, uh, if there are high performance aircraft uh, introduced into this theater, that there will be a reaction from us that... Uh, uh, well, we have let them and we've let the Soviet Union know that uh, uh, this is something that we cannot sit back and just take if they do that, because that is so obviously then a threat to the area. That's not, def well, their whole military today isn't defensive. Their whole military is greater than all the combined countries of Central America put together. And uh, it's, it's so obviously offensive in nature that we can't ignore that. And that would be just the crowning thing, to have those high-performance planes representing a threat to, uh, to the area and to the hemisphere and to, We've made it plain that uh, we are not going to sit by quietly and accept that. Do you think, sir, that, <clears throat> that the, the MiG crate episode and the six ships that are on, believed on their way now is in any way a, an attempt by the Soviet Union to test your resolve on, on this issue? Maybe I don't know whether it is or not. I sort, know they sort do. Sort of like the missile crate, yeah, Kennedy's, the Cuban. Yeah, I know they do things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so we, we're keeping watch on the. Uh, What's there? We're not going to uh, raise cane over a, a purely domestic type cargo or anything of that kind, but uh, we are in contact with the Soviet Union. And Do you know if weapons are, or MiGs spe specifically are on any of those six ships you mentioned? No. 
We do know that in several of the uh, ports uh, where those ships have um, uh, touched down, or uh, there have been uh, evidence of, of those aircraft uh, and crates that could contain them. And uh, we, we want to know that after the ships leave, uh, <laughs> those aircraft are still there. Was one of those places Libya, Mr. President? I, I would be guessing now, because my memory doesn't tell me, of all the reports we've had, uh, I don't know whether I couldn't, uh, uh, I couldn't tell you specifically. Certainly that Black Sea port, though. Yes, yeah. I would think Libya would be a, a probability. Yeah. Speak, yeah. Speaking of Libya, Mr. President, your administration has taken a strong rhetorical line against state terrorism. What are you going to do about uh, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi of Libya, the world's most prominent practitioner of terrorism? Well, again, it's one of those things that uh, you can know and he can talk, and, uh, but you can't really, you couldn't go into court and prove <laughs> that actually uh, uh, they, were the, they were responsible for it any more than you could have a couple of other governments that uh, we feel are apparently uh, supporting terrorist movements. So what we do is, is try, intelligence is the most important thing with regard to terrorism. Can you in some way find uh, or get access to information that would uh, let you know where and when operations are planned? Uh, can you get information that really ties a terrorist group uh, to a certain force or a certain uh, government. Among these, the things that we're trying to do is if, and we're uh, having some reasonable success with getting together with the other nations to uh, do what we did uh, some years ago with regard to hijackings, so that we all pool our information. We all inform each other of everything that we know, and we take action to, uh, so that there are no uh, safe harbors for terrorists, that they can't cross a border and find that they uh, won't be uh, troubled. Would, excuse me, sir. I, I would have thought there was overwhelming evidence that Gaddafi was involved in terrorism everywhere from Northern Ireland to Mindanao. Well, uh, yes, except when the bomb goes off, uh, can you establish a, That you know, particular a, bomb. Yeah, sometimes you get uh, uh, you get those phone calls of somebody claiming credit, but when you get two or three different outfits claiming the credit, <laughs> you say, well, which ones are just bragging? The other thing is, when it comes to, uh, if you can't intercept a, a punish to retaliate, there again, you've got to be able to get some evidence as to where are the bases from whence come these terrorists that you could strike at. And at the same time, you have to recognize that you don't want to just carelessly go out and maybe kill innocent people, then you're as bad as the terrorists. Well, if the terrorists are in a village uh, living amongst people who are innocent, are they then safe from retaliation? Well, it's, you know what, that's a decision that I think you have to make on each particular a case. I do know of one instance in which we thought we had uh, pretty good evidence of the locale, but again, to attempt to pick out uh, the guilty uh, would have would have been impossible. You would have you would have wiped out a lot of innocent people who had uh, nothing to do with well, it. If you ever get a clear-cut case where you know exactly where the terrorists came from and that uh, there's no question of their responsibility. What then is the nature of the retaliation? I think there, what George Schultz said in his speech that caused a little hoopla for a time, what he was saying to our people was that you must recognize that in this whole thing, if you're going to try to defend against terrorism, there are going to come some times when military action will be called for. And you need the public understanding of that and their awareness so that they will know it is necessary if you're to conquer this problem. Mr. President, 
President, why is Assistant Secretary of State Chester Cronker negotiating with all sides in the Angola crisis to get the Cubans out and reach a settlement, except for Jonas Savimbi, who's one of the strongest anti-communist leaders in the region there? Uh, and will you recognize Marxist Angola if the Cuban troops leave? The, what, what Secretary Crocker's been doing is actually having to do with Namibia. Uh, it's Namibia and its independence. And there is the 435 resolution of the United Nations about Namibia's right to become a country. Well, it's South, right now it's South Africa territory. Now, South Africa is willing for Namibia to become independent. But not when on the northern border of Namibia sits Angola with the Cubans and the possibility remains of Namibia becoming another satellite of the communist bloc. So what he's back and forth negotiating is that for to create Namibia for Angola to agree to remove the Cuban troops and South Africa uh, has agreed that they will move out and they will be helpful in making this a state. And he's made quite a bit of progress. For the first time, Angola has made a declaration that they are prepared to uh, bring about the withdrawal. It's a negotiating matter. They, they want to phase it and they have some conditions uh, on doing this. And uh, so, he has come back uh, just recently, but he'll be going back again. But that's where it stands, and at least that's the first time in all the years that this has been going on that uh, Angola has said, yes, they will remove Cuban troops. If, if the negotiations are successful, would you then recognize Angola, the government of Angola, if the Cuban troops leave? I think that that would be a part of the whole negotiated, mm -hmm. or the negotiations that are going on. Doesn't that risk throwing someone like Jonas Savimbi to the wolves in effect, though? Well, this is another problem, and I can't talk about that. Uh, no one wants to do that. But certainly that has to figure in uh, the whole negotiations. No, we're not, going to, uh, we're not going to turn on him, but somehow there has to be a negotiation that involves that situation domestically in Angola. Mr. President, the Syrians seem now to have become the serious focus in the Middle East, and with your September 1982 peace plan uh, at least grievously wounded, if not dying, uh, do you think it can be revived, or if not, uh, do you have another initiative that you're going to pursue there? Well, no, I think that was the proper course to take, and I think that it is a little closer than it's been for some time. The very fact now that uh, King Hussein has recognized Egypt which kind of strengthens each position as being accepted back in the Arab community, uh, even though it has the peace treaty with Israel. Uh, the recognition the other day, or the uh, restoring of relations with Iraq uh, is a step forward. I think that there has been uh, some trust build up uh, by the moderate Arab states in the United States as an intermediary in trying to bring about, see, we're not trying to negotiate the peace. They have to negotiate the peace. Syria is, and still is the stumbling block, but even so, now there is the negotiation going on with regard to the removal of Israeli troops from, uh, uh, from Lebanon. So I think that some things are, are coming together now, which, if anything, including the fact that the PLO held its it's meeting in Amman instead of in Damascus. Uh, I think these things are all leading toward the possibility, again, of getting the Arab states to agree to negotiate. You, you see, they've been sitting there with a the position that they refuse to recognize Israel's right to exist as a nation. Well, you can't negotiate with someone until that's removed. Well, Egypt did it, and now I think the attitude of Hussein shows that uh, Jordan can't be alone in doing that. But I think that what they're saying is that if the others can come together on this and uh, enter into negotiations, 
the PLO, uh, we now see them taking on uh, the radical faction in their own midst that was pro-Syrian. And uh, we're, we're going to do everything we can <coughs> to hopefully encourage this. Final yeah. question, uh, Mr. President. As, uh, and I want to thank you for being so generous with your time to us. As uh, most presidents go into their second term, and not many of them do nowadays, it seems. Somebody shut off there. That's all right, because we're going here. Yeah. Um, many of them seem to start thinking about their place in history. What would you like to see be your legacy to this country from eight years of Reagan presidency? Peace and freedom and the government back in the hands of the people. Um, what no, will you settle for? I, huh? What will you settle for? <laughs> I'm. I'll only settle. If we're off the record, I'm going to get ourselves to the Ted Cruz campaign. One of the warmest moments in the rally. There's an agenda gap. We're very proud to be on the East Coast. About four rows out. There's a big rally. She was holding a sign. Always stay home, mate. Just like that. Four rows out. There's a big rally. She was holding a sign. Always stay home, mate. And he said, he's not old, he's cute. <laughs> <laughs> I treasure that. <laughs>